Okay, hello. Sorry about that. I had a little problem with my headset. Hopefully you guys can hear me now. Um, let me just double check. If someone could raise their hand, if they can hear me, so I don't speak for like 15 minutes before I figure out. Okay, we are good. Thank you. Whew, it's a little tense here at the Chaos Institute, <laughs> trying to get our equipment. So here's the true story. I was on vacation for two weeks. I went Took my every summer I take my mother back to the town that she grew up in, which happens to be on the Big Island of Hawaii, which is convenient because it's nice to go to Hawaii. And we rent this big house in the middle of nowhere, and um, we had two weeks visiting family. And my uncle Mike has this ranch, 500 acre ranch on the coast, and it's just an amazing place. We bomb around in the ATVs, and he raises heirloom plants like papayas and mangoes and I've got like 70 different kinds of bananas and anyways really cool guy and interesting times and my auntie Bernie is an animal whisperer she literally can talk to animals if you've seen Dr. Doodledal like for real she can do this like um, uh, it's just a fascinating place to be anyway so I'm taking a little bit of time here to get readjusted to this whole doctor thing because I had two weeks without my computer and um, and all good you know and uh, yeah, I love it there. Anyways, those are my people. And uh, okay, so now I'm trying to focus and we're back in the you know, saddle. I did a whole week of patients and kind of back into this whole chronic illness story. So what today, today is sort of a special class. I wanna divide it up into little chunks and I wanna cover you know, all the things you need to know about treating the brain. And so we're gonna assume a certain amount of knowledge like like you guys have some of this stuff just figured out from clinical nutrition training and whatnot, and just go for you know treatment reality stuff, so we can be really focused and you can learn some clinical tools that you can start to use right away. And hopefully some of these are you know things that you're not familiar with already, so it's going to be meaningful and helpful on a bunch of different levels. All right, so let us get going here. Hang on, my screen's not participating. My computer had a two-week vacation also, and it's like, you know, just kind of doing what it wants this week. <laughs> there, okay, now we're both back. So we're gonna talk about, we're gonna divide this up into different sections, okay? So we're gonna talk about stress versus inflammatory mediated brain problems. We're going to take a deep breath. We're going to look at amino acids and fatty acids and how you can use those effectively. We're going to talk about testing with organic acids and then the importance of essential amino acids. And so we had this wonderful conversation with this group of scientists uh, about a month ago in Boston, when I was out in Boston, and we were talking about amino acids and um, you know someone made this joke and it was one of those jokes that was uh, kind of um, funny but poignant at the same time right because it was exactly the truth which is that essential amino acids are essential like they're not optional. They're not like sometimes when you feel like it. They're not like, oh, if you're paleo, oh, if you're vegan. Essential amino acids human beings have to consume. Or, and here's the quiz question for tonight. What happens if you don't have essential amino acids, even one of them, if, if it's missing, is you cannot assemble proteins. Okay, and there's nothing more crippling to the human body than not being able to assemble proteins. So when we take a deep dive and we start to look at all these complicated things, um, as we will with the brain, you know, you also want to think in the biggest picture possible, which is what about proteins? Okay. And there's an essential amino acid that we're going to talk about tonight that is very much usually thought of or relegated to being a neurotransmitter precursor, and yet it is an essential amino acid. And most of you probably know what I'm talking about, but that amino acid is the rate limiting step 
in the production of all proteins. Okay, so I'm going to say that again because that's it's a little too much to take in. This amino acid, tryptophan, right? Forget what it does for your brain for the moment. It's the rate limiting step in the assembly of all proteins, gut proteins, proteins that make up your bones, proteins that make up your your brain, proteins that make up everything, all the tissues in your body, everything that has a protein to it, right? Protein component to it, absolutely is dependent on tryptophan. And it's not only an essential amino acid, but it's the rate limiting step in the ability to assemble proteins. So you can't repair your gut lining without tryptophan. You can't build muscle tissue without tryptophan. You can't do anything repair wise without tryptophan. And so we want to kind of expand, you know, our concept of, of these amino acids uh, beyond just what we're talking about with the brain, right? Okay, so that's the intro. Now here's part one. We're going to talk about first the biggest picture, part one, three types of neurotransmitter imbalances. You can have a neurotransmitter deficiency, that is clear. You can have a damaged bunch of neurons, that is not a good thing, but increasingly common. And you can have bad genes, which we can measure in a variety of ways. Genetic testing, you can also see on organic acids markers and fatty acid markers and amino acid markers, you can see a lot of the genetic components there. So to break that out, neurotransmitter deficiency, part one here, obviously if you're stressed, you're gonna burn through your brain chemicals. If you eat poor quality food, you're not gonna get the nutrients you need to make the brain chemicals. If your digestion's not working well, this whole thing falls apart. The centerpiece for all human health and the functional medicine construct is your gut, right? So we're not talking about the gut tonight, except for to say that if your digestion is not working well, you know, you gotta start there. Drug depletion, you know, taking prescription drugs, Adderall, Zoloft, Wellbutrin, taking recreational drugs, cocaine, heroin, speed, any of these things will deplete neurotransmitters. And chronic inflammation, which we're gonna focus on tonight, in other parts of the body can deplete neurotransmitters. So chronic inflammation in the gut, chronic inflammation from fighting infections will deplete neurotransmitters. And we'll show all those pathways. So that's item number one. Item number two, damaged neurons. Probably one of the more underappreciated aspects of all this chronic illness stuff is head trauma. My teacher's teacher, Dr. Timmons was my main laboratory interpretation teacher. One of his teachers was one of the greats of all time, Theron Randolph. And one of the questions Dr. Randolph asked all his new patients was not if you had head trauma, but when did you have your head trauma? So certain was he that his chronic illness patients had head trauma that he just wanted to know when it was, not if it had happened. And so when you have significant head trauma, you get disruption of the immune system. You get a very predictable problem with the neurons in the brain. That's going to cause anxiety, depression, fatigue, all these other kinds of problems. So just always be on the lookout for that. Head trauma damages neurons as much as clearly, as definitively as a toxin would. So you want to be on the lookout for neurotoxins or head trauma that damages neurons. It's like the difference between somebody getting shot to death or stabbed to death. Either way, the brain cell is dead. It doesn't matter if you got hit by a mercury molecule and that chewed up the brain cell, or if your head hit the windshield of a car and that's what destroyed the brain cell, right? Either head trauma or toxins damage neurons, destroy neurons, and again, ultimately, it doesn't matter whether it's a toxin or head trauma, you get the same general effect, which is that the neuronal system is damaged. Item number three, in this schematic would be the genetic factors. And so there's a bunch of different ways you can determine genetic factors and uh, that's super important. So again, neurotransmitter deficiency from stress, diet, inflammation leads to the same exact kinds of problems. The brain cells don't work well, people get overweight, they eat too much, they get tired, they get depressed. Neurotoxin damage from uh, I'm sorry, uh, brain cell damage from a neurotoxin or from a head injury 
is going to cause the same exact reaction, right? So whether it's a neurotoxin or whether it's head trauma, you're going to have brain cell damage, you're going to have poor neurotransmitter function, you're going to have weight gain, you're going to have fatigue, you're going to have depression. Can't really tell from the symptoms what's going on. The genetic type, same thing. You could have a deficit of something like copper or the essential fatty acids. You're going to get weight gain, depression, you know, et cetera, all the same. So when we're looking at conditions related to the brain, weight gain, fatigue, depression, eating disorders, binge eating, food cravings, that's all typically coming from the brain, overlaid with emotional stuff, right? So the emotional component is obviously a, a huge, if not the biggest component to all these problems. We can't, I just don't run lab tests for the emotional stuff, so I don't talk about that. But I'm assuming, again, a lot of knowledge. I'm assuming that we all accept that the spiritual disconnection and emotional trauma that human beings go through is at the root of all of these problems. Okay, let's just assume that that's the case. And then we can just get on with it and look at the labs. So um, anxiety, panic attacks, insomnia, body pain that's not explained by injury, fibromyalgia, restless leg syndrome, migraine, headaches, ADD, ADHD, ADT, V, B, T, U, U, whatever of the numbers, letters you want to put on there, right? There's tons of syndromes that are related, OCD, right? You go on and on with the acronyms. Parkinson's, kind of an extreme example of dopamine neuron damage, the substantia nigra, drug dependency, drug depletion, traumatic brain injury. I mean, it's almost the entire human population when you start to add all these things up. A lot of people have brain-related problems. And so there's two general groupings here. We've got the serotonin grouping and we've got the catecholamine grouping, somewhat artificial because they're interacting with one another and it's one integrated brain obviously but you know we divide it up because the labs are divided up so it's easier to see it on the labs if you start, start to think of it in a divided up kind of way serotonin interestingly named for what they first discovered it did serum the blood right watery fluid and tonic or tonin tonic right so they first noticed serotonin in its capacity to uh, contract and relax blood vessels long before they identified that it was a super important chemical in your brain. And so this is a really important concept, I think, because serotonin exists primarily in the human body outside the brain, and it does a lot of other stuff besides act as a neurotransmitter. So in the brain, it operates and helps control our appetite. It helps regulate sleep, obviously mood, anxiety, migraines. Uh, remember serotonin, vasoconstriction, vasorelaxation, as well as peristaltic contraction in the gut. So serotonin imbalances can cause constipation. Serotonin imbalances can cause problems with controlling of the blood vessels, which can lead to migraines. So serotonin inside the brain, big issue. Serotonin outside the brain, big issue too. So you want to think, you know, broader when you think about serotonin. So you're not just thinking about it as a neurotransmitter inside the brain. Here's how all this stuff actually happens for those of you that enjoy physiology and charts. I really like charts, so I just throw these in there. Hopefully, if you don't like charts, just check your phone, do like one or two emails, and then come back because we'll be done with this in a couple of minutes. But here we go. Tryptophan is an essential amino acid. It's the rate-limiting step in the synthesis of body proteins. And that's where a lot of tryptophan goes. Up to 90% of the tryptophan okay, is going towards that direction. It is also a precursor to serotonin. And so some of the tryptophan, this diagram estimates 2 to 10%, goes to 5-HTP, which ultimately ends up being produced, uh, turned into serotonin. Right? Some of that serotonin goes into the gut. Some of that serotonin, some of that 5-HTP, you know, or tryptophan goes into the brain and is, you know, produced as a neurotransmitter. We also, strangely enough, take tryptophan and make niacin out of it, as well as these markers we're going to show in a minute, see in a minute, uh, picolinate, quinolinate, kynurinate, it has this whole other role. And then serotonin can also make melatonin. So there's a lot going on with serotonin. I'm mean, sorry, a lot going on with tryptophan. Tryptophan can make serotonin, melatonin. It can be turned into niacin, picolinate. It can be turned into body proteins. And I'll say this for the 10th time, tryptophan is a rate-limiting step in the synthesis of all proteins except for collagen. Okay? And here's how it works in the brain. Just briefly, we look at this, and we see that you have a presynaptic neuron down here that makes some serotonin. It gets squirted out into the synapse 
it hits the postsynaptic neuron, signals it to do stuff, and then it's pulled back in to that presynaptic neuron where it's protected. Here we have your tryptophan, your vitamin B3, your 5-HTP, your vitamin B6, and you suddenly become rich in serotonin only if you have tryptophan, B3, and B6. So think about the B vitamins as the nutrients that help us break down, metabolize, utilize amino acids. Think about the B vitamins as the nutrients that help us break down, metabolize, utilize, convert amino acids. That tryptophan molecule sitting there without the B3 is just going to sit there in its own little lonely world. Okay. That 5-HTP molecule sitting there without vitamin B6 is just going to sit there and stagnate. It's like a couch potato binge watching Netflix episodes of, of like Breaking Bad or something. The 5-HTP is just not going anywhere. As soon as B6 shows up, whoop, we make serotonin. You're off the couch. You're doing stuff, right? So B vitamins are the nutrients that help us, not help us, but that determine how much we can use these amino acids. The amino acids by themselves just sit there. You got to have the B vitamins or none of this happens. So if you're really going to get like nitpicky about it and you were going to say, hey, what's the most important nutrient between 5-HTP and B6 for serotonin production? For sure, it would be B6 because you could have all the 5-HTP in the world and without that B6, nothing's going to happen. Okay? And just a little bit of 5-HTP and a lot of B6, you're going to get some reactions. So that's the basic physiology of it. Now, I've wondered about this question for like, I don't know, maybe 20 years. And now I can finally answer it, which is when should you use tryptophan? And when should you use 5-HTP? So there's lab report answers to that question, which I'll show you in a minute. But then there's also just like clinical stuff. So 5-HTP, converts with B6, converts readily into serotonin. And there's no mechanism to prevent that from happening. So if you give the person increasing amounts of 5-HTP along with B6, your body's just going to make more and more and more serotonin. There's no stop mechanism there. There's no off switch. That's good and bad. Okay. 5-HTP is not an essential amino acid. 5-HTP does not help, you know, provide this pivotal role in the synthesis of every single protein in the human body except for collagen. 5-HTP is a little more specific to serotonin and melatonin production. So it's good and bad, okay? Tryptophan converts to 5-HTP and then over to serotonin, but there's a little block. So if serotonin levels get to a certain point, then the tryptophan conversion to 5-HTP will stop. So there's a limit to how high you can get serotonin with tryptophan. There's a natural mechanism, it's this enzyme that shuts this system down. So 5-HTP, unlimited conversion, tryptophan, limited conversion. So depending on how desperate that patient is, if they really need a major brain overhaul, 5-HTP is gonna work better. If they need a moderate brain overhaul, you know, tryptophan can work better. However, Tryptophan is the rate-limiting step in the synthesis of all proteins except for collagen. So tryptophan, in some ways, has a massively important role body-wide okay, in gut repair, in muscle tissue rebuilding, in everything that your chronic fatigue patients need to get better. Tryptophan is important. So each of them has a different role, um, and you can use them both. You can use one, but as long as you understand those two distinctions, um, there's a place for each of them depending on, on how hard you want to push the serotonin up or how much you want to support other body tissues besides the brain, okay? So that's an important distinction. You can use them both. I use them both regularly, you know, on a, you know, every day with patients. So it's not a better or worse one. Uh, oh, and let me just show you the lab view of this while we're on the subject. So you can also tell from these tests which one you may want to use. Uh, as an example, this is a ion panel from Genova. And fortunately, they measure tryptophan. How convenient is that? So here you can see tryptophan levels. This patient happens to be high in tryptophan. If they're low in tryptophan, you would probably want to give tryptophan. Hmm, good question. What does it mean if they're high? Eating too much turkey? Well, not really. They're high in a whole bunch of amino acids here. 
I already gave you the answer for this one. So everyone should just think hard for a second. What are the nutrients that help break down amino acids? B vitamins. So you could have high levels of amino acids from eating too much meat. You could have high levels of amino acids from taking too many amino acid powders or too many protein powders, but that's very rare, okay? Most of the time when you see high amino acid levels in the blood, this is a blood test, it means that they're circulating in the blood and not getting into cells where we can utilize them, which is bad, because the person doesn't have enough B vitamins to metabolize and break down the amino acids. So if you see a pattern of high amino acids, you start giving 50 to 100, maybe even 200 milligrams of vitamin B6, the body will then, along with the B complex, so a B complex plus additional B6, 50, 100, maybe as much as 200 milligrams for some patients, probably 100 is a little safer, that'll help the person to start to break down and use the amino acids. So if tryptophan levels are high, assuming the person is not over consuming tryptophan, it means that the tryptophan is circulating in the blood, not getting into the cells where you want to use it. B vitamins are required for that. Okay. So anyways, if the tryptophan was low, then we would give tryptophan. Just wanted to point that out. And then for the 5-HTP, that shows up down here and right here. So tryptophan, high or low, gives you an indication you might want to use tryptophan. And then these markers here give you an indication of maybe you want to use 5-HTP. So if this marker is high, 5-hydroxyindolacetate, often they show it as 5-HIAA, that number is high, it means you're burning through your serotonin really quickly and you could probably use some 5-HTP. Super important. And that would be more stress mediated. If any one of these three markers here, kynurinate, quinolinate, or picolinate are high, any of these are, or all three of these are high, that indicates brain inflammation. Okay, brain inflammation. And you'd want to do something about that. You know, figure out where's the inflammation coming from. So you can learn about tryptophan on the amino acid testing, high or low, depending if you want to use tryptophan or not. And then here, again, with the 5-HIAA marker being up or down, you can use either 5-HTP, which most people would do, or tryptophan if you want to have a more global effect or you feel like there's reasons why you want to get more tissue repair going. Tryptophan may be a better choice than the 5-HTP. Again, I use them both every day, so you can go back and forth there. All right. Peripheral serotonin, I already kind of alluded to this. Serotonin uh, levels are important in the brain, but it does all these other things throughout the body as well. Conditions impacted by dopamine. Again, same kind of list, weight loss, mood, energy, depression. A little different than the serotonin problems typically. More focus, concentration issues. I find almost all the OCD type patients and restless leg type shaking patients with tremors, almost always it's dopamine related, more so than serotonin. So there is some differentiation, but you can tell from the labs also obviously which way to go. And then similarly, you have the pathways here. You've got your dopamine made from tyrosine, converts to L-dopa, then to dopamine, then to norepinephrine, and then to epinephrine. So all these together are the catecholamines, right? Dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. And we can treat basically very similarly for all three of those. So tyrosine and an herb called macuna, it's an herbal form of L-dopa, can be used for either dopamine, norepinephrine, or epinephrine problems. B6 is lurking around in here as well. Okay, you have to have the B6 or this won't work. And you also need some copper. If the person is deficient in copper, then none of this is going to work. Again, dopamine helps with everything from fine motor activity, which is why people get tremors when it's messed up, blood pressure, focus, inspiration, intuition, enthusiasm, joy. I mean, the dopamine is a pretty important chemical, the chemical of reward, right? And if it's uh, you know depleted, um, people get pretty cranky and unhappy. And I'll tell you, I see low dopamine in my clinic. I don't want to exaggerate, but yeah, every day. I mean, certainly not every case, but I see low, low dopamine in my clinic literally every day. It's something that pops up. And if you're not seeing it every day and you're treating you know tons of patients, then you're probably missing it. So you want to think about this and how much that might be able to help people. Right? That is a pretty important one. 
And then there's these mechanisms that control this whole system, these reuptake pumps. And those mechanisms, those reuptake pumps are, you know, what the SSRI medications uh, adjust. The reuptake, reuptake pumps, the technical term for them, they call them organic cation transporters, or you'll see them called OCT2 transporters or gates. And they change in three-dimensional shape. They're these electrochemical challenge. And they're what shuffles the serotonin in and out of the cell. Okay, and so they're really important. And they're the main control mechanisms. They're the aspects of this whole system that's actually um, most important in terms of controlling what is where, in terms of where the things are actually located. And that turns out to be really important because where things are located is where the chemicals are going to have their effect. So that becomes super important. And you can regulate and control these pumps with amino acids. How cool is that? So you can use amino acids to re regulate these pumps. Whew, that's pretty deep when you think about it. We're actually affecting the brain in a pretty significant way. All right, so let's um, take a, a two second break. It's like a little emotional, take a deep breath moment. You know, the weird thing is I drink a lot of water and I can actually feel the water getting absorbed now. I know that sounds maybe kind of cosmic and weird, but I've been drinking water my whole life and never really thought about it. Anyways, I'm gonna have a sip of water. Okay, round two. So let's like regather our thoughts and now we're gonna get into a little more of the physiology and the biochemistry and the treatment options. So number one, we have the neurotransmitters from amino acids, and we've already talked about this in the earlier section, but let's mention it again. You have tyrosine that converts to L-DOPA. You can you get supplements with tyrosine in them. You can get supplements with L-DOPA in them. The herb is called macuna. It's an herbal form of L-DOPA, but it is actually L-DOPA. And combined together, tyrosine and L-DOPA will convert into dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. And this is one of my favorite things to do with patients because a lot of people need the help and a lot of doctors don't know how to do this. So let us look then at the markers that would indicate that a person needs that. And I'm just gonna draw on this lab so we don't have to hunt around for a bunch of labs. So if a person has vanomandolate or homovanolate, either quite high or extremely low, it means they have a catecholamine problem. Sometimes one is high, sometimes they're both high, sometimes they're both low, sometimes, you know, variations. I guess the worst case scenario is they're both low. That would mean the system's really exhausted. Vanomandolate reflects epinephrine or adrenaline levels along with norepinephrine or noradrenaline. If homovanolate is more exclusively reflecting what's happening with dopamine. If you see either of these high or low, the first thing that you should do is question where the sulfur compounds are. So then you just scoot down to this portion of the test and look at the sulfate marker right here. And if the sulfate marker is low, that's what Dr. Richard Lord calls glutathione collapse. Not a good thing for protection against toxins, right? So if the sulfate marker is low, your toxin protection is gone, very likely dopamine related neurons are being damaged from the neurotoxins that are in your system. So again, if glutathione levels are low, as reflected by low sulfate, it's very likely that there's going to be a consequential problem with, uh, with dopamine because the dopamine related neurons are being damaged. Okay. Um, we're going to look at the tryptophan pathway in a minute. Oh, and there's a special offer here. If you sign up by September 5th using your promo code, you get a grand off the one year mentorship. People are already starting to sign up. If you're thinking about it, you should sign up. It's a great class and we're making it better all the time. Class starts September 10th. All right, let us look for a moment now at this other diagram. I'm gonna skip around a little bit just cause I wanna show you the labs here. So in order to make, again, in order to make um, the catecholamines, epinephrine and norepinephrine, you have to have sulfur amino acids. You need sulfur amino acids for a lot of other things too, but you have to have sulfur amino acids 
to make epinephrine and norepinephrine. And the same is true for dopamine. I don't see dopamine on this diagram, but it should be, okay? So if the sulfur compounds are low, the sulfate marker is low, it means that the, it's very likely the person is not able to or is struggling to make enough dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. And remember, the sulfur compounds are responsible for producing glutathione. So that same person is going to have a problem with producing um, uh, glutathione that's going to protect them against neurotoxins. And that's a really bad combination. We have a lot of weakness in the sulfate system, so neurotoxins are getting in. They're damaging the dopamine-related neurons. You're not even able to make enough dopamine because you don't have enough of the sulfur compounds from which you make dopamine, and the whole thing just sort of falls apart. So that's a super, super common scenario you want to be on the lookout for. You can see it on the labs, right? This is not like a mystery. Should I show you again? Let me show you one more time. So sulfate is low in this instance, right? And that's an alarm bell. You immediately look at the catecholamine markers. And if you see that they're either low or high, low is worse typically for most people, either low or high, then you've got a problem with the catecholamines that's being reinforced by or you know even you know sort of stimulated by the problem with uh, neurotoxin exposure and this is super common we see this every day right exposure to chemicals heavy metals damage to the brain these markers all, sh all start to go off get out of balance so on the other pathway tryptophan and this is I mean, I think it's kind of interesting, but you should just know this. Tryptophan, and where are we now? Are we in the brain? No, that is, this is not a bad drawing of someone's brain. This is the liver. We should probably write that on the slide in case it wasn't obvious. Liver, not brain. Liver, liver, liver. So in the liver, we take tryptophan and we convert it into these things called kynurinate, quinolinate, um, the B vitamins we already talked about, right? And then as a urinary byproduct, we make this stuff called xanthurinate, as well as this other stuff called kynurinate. So in the liver, you can measure what the liver is doing. You can measure what the liver is doing with all these. And you do that quite simply by looking at this one marker right here, xanthurinate. So xanthurinate tells you what's happening with you know, uh, with vitamin B6, and it's basically the tryptophan pathway in your liver. So if xanthurinate is high, it means that you don't have enough B6, and so the tryptophan pathway in the liver is all messed up, okay? So high xanthurinate means you need B6. What is B6 really important for? Tryptophan, right? Breaking tryptophan down and converting it into other things. So as part of a brain program, you always got to scope out the xanthurinate marker and see, does this person need B6? I would always give B6 for any brain program. If the xanthurinate marker is high, you would give extra B6. So for anybody doing a neurotransmitter program, at least 50 milligrams of B6. If you see that the xanthurinate marker is high, probably 100, maybe 150. Maybe for some people, they need as much as 200 milligrams of B6 to overcome all the deficits they may have. Okay, so xanthurinate is very important. And then the other markers that we just saw, and I'm going to scoot down to just a different lab, just come tired of looking at this one and see find a different one down here uh, here we go yeah here we go so then the other markers we can look at kynurinate is also produced by the liver in the liver as a result of breaking down tryptophan quinolinate and picolinate primarily made in the brain so in some cases, you might see a kynurinate level high, okay? But quinolinate and picolinate are not high. So if you see that pattern, high kynurinate, but these two are low, that's probably not a brain problem, okay? Or it's a really severe brain problem. It can go either way. So what you should see typically, if it's just B6 only, is that kynurinate's high and xanthurinate is high. Okay, if those two are high, then you know it's a liver problem, it's a B6 problem. If xanthurinate is normal, like in this one, and kynurinate is high by itself, then you can be pretty sure that the problem's going on in the brain. Okay, so kynurinate being high could be liver or brain, xanthurinate helps you differentiate. 
which one it may be. And that is a handy little thing to know when you're interpreting these labs. You can figure out exactly what's going on. And here are the pathways to help you solidify that. Xanthurinate and kinurinate go up when the body doesn't have enough B6 to send the tryptophan down that away. Okay. So that is an important little distinction. If the person's brain is inflamed, you have this inflammation that's going to drive this IDO enzyme system, that's going to drive the kinurinate up, the quinolinate up. Now we're in the brain. This is the brain we're in now. And that high quinolinate you know, activates, stimulates this whole glutamate system so in such an exaggerated way that the person can get anxiety and depression and sleep problems and all kinds of things because so the brain's not working very well. Okay, one of the things that you can do to help calm that whole thing down is magnesium and then the other, you know, amino acid support that we're talking about. Okay, so that's important too. Tryptophan pathway in the liver, tryptophan pathway in the brain. The confusing part is that kinurinate is in both of them, but xanthurinate is the only one that's in the liver. So it helps you differentiate. So now, let's take another break here as I collect my thoughts. And let's find, yeah, let's do this. Okay. All right, so now we're in for round three here. It's going to get kind of heavy, but hopefully you guys can deal with this. Where are you going here? Oh, there it is. Sorry, I kept slipping over the side. Okay, here we go. Round three. You ready? Type one neurotransmitter deficiency. High stress, bad diet, bad digestion, drug depletion, or for many of our chronically ill patients, it's inflammation that's driving the neurotransmitter levels down. How does that happen? Pretty well documented. High levels of inflammation from a viral infection, from a gut infection, is going to drive this overproduction of cytokines. It's going to drive high levels of kinurinate and quinolinate and picolinate, and it's going to deplete the tryptophan because the tryptophan is being diverted through these pathways to deal with the inflammatory problem to crank up the cytokines, and there's not enough available tryptophan for serotonin production in the brain. So the more inflamed we are, the more infections we have, the lower and lower and lower the serotonin levels go. Kinurinate pathway is kind of the heart of that. And you can supplement with 5-HTP to resolve this, right? 5-HTP is pretty safe to use because it's past the step here, like if you're worried about trip, if you're worried about giving tryptophan to someone because they're inflamed and you're worried that it's going to come down and make this pathway worse, just give them 5-HTP. It's past that problem, right? There's no way you could convert the 5-HTP backward. So if there's an inflamed brain and you're worried about using tryptophan, just use 5-HTP instead. Similarly, when you're inflamed, your mother-in-law could inflame you. Giardia could inflame you. It can have, you know, liver toxicity inflaming you. Whatever it is, the inflammatory cytokines are now activated. We're cranking up our quinolinate, picolinate, kinurinate, right? All these things are getting cranked up, and it's directly related to the dopamine and catecholamine pathways as well. You can see here. Tyrosine converting into L-dopa, or the herbal product Macuna is the herbal form of L-dopa and then coming down here. So the more inflamed you are, the more both the catecholamine system and the serotonin system start to get depleted. So I wanted to um, mention again the conversion issues, right? So 5-HTP converts on an unlimited way to serotonin. Tryptophan has some limits to it. Tyrosine has a limit in how much it can convert into dopamine. Macuna, no limit. Okay, Makuna is a herbal form of L-dopa. So Makuma is a little bit more powerful, well, not a little bit, it's a quite a bit more powerful than tyrosine in the fact that the more Makuna you give, the more um, dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine are going to go up. Okay, we already mentioned this with 5-HTP. There's no limit to the conversion with 5-HTP. Serotonin will just be driven up as much as you want. B6, most important cofactor, not just with serotonin, but also with the catecholamines. Got to have B6 in the program, even if their B6 markers are okay. If a program's not working and you add B6, sometimes that's enough. The other common mistake I've made, if a program's not working, you might need to add some sulfur amino acids 
to get the dopamine levels up, right? So keep in mind if program's not going as you should as it should be, B6 or sulfur amino acids are often missing. And sulfur amino acids, you can use methionine, taurine, cysteine. You have a bunch of different choices there in terms of which sulfur amino acid you want to use. Not only is it really great for catecholamines, but also helps um, people uh, detoxify, which we already mentioned in the earlier section. Selenium, super important. It's a mineral, kind of strange. It's also a really powerful antioxidant, especially important for protecting the brain. People also use it for the thyroid, so that should be a part of any of these programs. Folate, another essential nutrient for all the things that we're talking about. You can't make any of these things work without folate. And then um, here's a summary of the tests that we want to think about. So in addition to the 5-HTP markers and tyrosine, we want to think about inflammation. That would be antioxidant levels are a really good thing to look at. B6 markers, glutathione markers, selenium, folate, and detox. So let's look at some labs for a moment. And I'll show you how you can check all that with a simple ion panel. So right off the bat, let's just look at folate. So folate is easy peasy. Folate is fig glue right here for miminoglutamate, more commonly known as fig glue. If fig glue is high, person needs folate. I was going to say no brainer, but that's not very funny. You have to have folate for the brain to work. So that one you want to always check. I'll just mention again because it's so important. You always give B6 in these programs, but if xanthurinate is high, they need even more B6 than you're thinking. You're going to need to give them some extra B6. B6 to cover their B6 deficiency plus extra B6 because you're trying to get them to make extra neurotransmitters. Now, we also mentioned selenium is critical. Well, isn't that convenient? This panel checks selenium. Where to go? Where is it at? Oh, and this one happens to be low. So if selenium is low, you want to make that part of your brain program. Even if it's not low, you could add it in because it's neuroprotective. It helps specifically with the brain fighting off problems with heavy metals, mercury, and all kinds of stuff. So that's really important. We also mentioned the sulfur amino acids are critical, right, for detox and also for dopamine production. Where are they? There's a whole section on those right here. They're just staring at you. They got them all. Here we go, sulfur amino acids. Dr. Lord is even kind enough for those of us that aren't paying attention to put in parentheses glutathione related. So if, if he, when he was designing these lab reports, I mean, if he, if he bothered to put two extra words on the report, it means, hey, pay attention because this is really, really, really important. So he's a minimalist, right? Methionine, cysteine, taurine, remember I mentioned those? Those are essential for Detox, essential for dopamine and catecholamine production. So if any of these are low, put them back in. If the program's not working, put them in, because that may be the simple step that you're missing. You gotta have these cofactors as well. And then we also said inflammation is you know, triggering all this. So what are some easy, straightforward inflammatory markers? Well, I think the easiest ones are really the you know, antioxidant markers. There's plenty of other ways you could approach this. But so if you see low levels of antioxidants, for example, CoQ10, vitamin E, vitamin A, beta carotene, any of these are low, that means the person is going to be susceptible to get inflamed because they don't have enough antioxidant protection. So you'd want to load them up on antioxidants. Similarly, if their 8-OHDG is low, I'm sorry, high. If the 8-OHDG is above a 4, 4 or over, above a 4, then you would also want to give some antioxidants to help support that person's, uh, you know, help reduce inflammation. Okay, so 8-OHDG, you got your fat-soluble antioxidant markers here, a bunch of stuff you can look at to reduce inflammation. Um, if 8-OHDG is high, you can give any of the antioxidants, right, vitamin E, vitamin C, um, beta carotene, you could do resveratrol, you could get a combination formula, you could use whatever you want to lower the oxidative stress. So let's look at that list again. And here are the things that you want to check on. Okay, are they inflamed? Is their brain inflamed? Look at the antioxidant markers and just load them up on antioxidants as needed. The B6 marker we mentioned, xanthurinate. You give B6 no matter what, you give extra B6 if that's low. The glutathione markers, the sulfur amino acid levels, right, that we just looked at. Use those if you're doing a catecholamine program and it's not working. 
or even if you're just starting one, right, make sure you're covering that. You want to protect the brain as well as have enough of the sulfur compounds to make stuff. Selenium, super important to protect the brain. Always check your selenium level. Folate, essential for making all these chemicals we're talking about. And then uh, the detox markers we can look at. Okay. And well, there's a bunch of ways you can look at the detox markers. Let's look at the easiest ones first. Here they are. So this section, detoxification, your methylhipparate, orotate, glucarate, alpha hydroxybutyrate, pyroglutamate, sulfate. There's six ways you can look at detox pathways right here. And we don't have time probably to get into exactly what all this means, but if these numbers are extremely low, or in any case of these markers extremely high, you've got a serious problem with detoxification that you want to start to think about. Okay, so low levels, especially of pyroglutamate and sulfate, or high levels of any of these markers indicates that there's a toxin-related issue. What we're worried about with the brain is neurotoxins, because that's one of the leading reasons why people have these problems in the first place. So you want to just check that out and make sure if they need a detox program that you're able to run one. All right. Now, we just got a few minutes left. I don't know where the time goes, but let's, let's look at the next section of this. And I think this deserves its whole own focus. Catecholamine synthesis. Let's really think about that for a minute. I'm going to read, so I hate it when people read slides, but let me just read this because it's a pretty good slide. Um, when under stress, the adrenal medulla produces epinephrine and norepinephrine in seconds as the adrenal cortex takes minutes to produce cortisol. So we're stressed, the adrenal cortex produces cortisol, the adrenal medulla is making these catecholamines. Boom, it's just game on, adrenal and catecholamine production just kicks right in. The cells of the adrenal medulla are modified sympathetic ganglia. It just means they're part of their nervous system, which is kind of interesting because the adrenals are sort of a hormone producing gland, but they're also part of your nervous system. So it's a, a inner, it's an area that's hard to define. It's kind of nervous system tissue, but it's hormone tissue all together at the same time. Epinephrine and norepinephrine are stored for quick release. Cortisol has to be made, it's not stored. That's that adrenaline rush, right? You go, you scare somebody, and then they're like, ah, they get that adrenaline rush. Like if you, if you, if you had to wait for cortisol to 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 take effect, you'd ah, you scare someone, and then be like a few minutes later, they'd be like, ah, right? So epinephrine and norepinephrine, that's an immediate response, like ah, crap, I'm gonna not hit this other car in front of me and slam on the brakes or whatever it is that's happening. Um, I hate people that like to scare other people, by the way. So don't even think about scaring me if you ever meet you at a conference or something. I hate when people do that, and um. I happen to be in the love with a woman who thinks that's really funny when she scares me and like, oh, really? Do you have to do that? Just stop. But anyways, that's adrenaline or epinephrine, right? That's catecholamine surge. So conversion of norepinephrine to epinephrine or dopamine to norepinephrine requires vitamin C. So you need adrenaline, you need that and so on and so on. Okay. So now let's look at why that I'm kind of dwelling on this for a minute because I want you to think about what's really happening here is that we're taking an amino acid, we're making L-DOPA, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, but it's happening in two different places at the same time. It's really confusing. It's happening in the adrenal medulla, the inside of the adrenal gland. And it's also happening in the brain, which we already looked at. Same chemicals, epinephrine and norepinephrine, or if you're British, adrenaline and noradrenaline, they're catecholamines, however you slice them. That's why when they say the adrenal medulla is making, is it a hormone or is it a neurotransmitter? It's kind of a neurohormone. I don't know. It's made in these two different areas, a hormone producing gland, and it's also made in your brain. That's super important because when you're treating, if the person has adrenal burnout or adrenal fatigue, it's very likely that their catecholamines have been dragged into this. Because remember, if your cortisol is getting stressed, your catecholamines got stressed already. Remember that, uh, like you get scared and the catecholamine surge right away, the cortisol comes up a little later. So by definition almost, if there's a cortisol problem, there's probably something that's going on with the catecholamines. Adrenal cortex, named for what it, um, 
where it is, right, the outer quarter, the outer ring of the adrenal glands, and cortisol named for where it's produced in the adrenal cortex. So if you want to kind of get the, the head, headline on that, when you're looking at these tests, one, you know, I do, I do adrenal panels, uh, just salivary adrenal hormones in every single patient I have done for over 20 years. And if you talk to anyone who's ever been a patient of mine, they'll say, oh, yeah, I had to do that spit test for Kalish. However, you can also see a general status update of the adrenal glands, adrenaline or epinephrine, norepinephrine production by looking at vanomandolate. Okay, so if vanomandolate is very low, it means epinephrine and norepinephrine are exhausted. It's kind of like adrenal exhaustion, but it's the medulla, not the cortex. And that's going to be commonly happening along with cortisol imbalances. The tricky part is that that also means that the epinephrine and norepinephrine in the brain is depleted. So you can have a lot of brain symptoms as this kind of overlap, mishmashy thing with the adrenal glands. So you get that. It's nervous system tissue in the adrenal medulla. It's the brain making the same chemicals. It's the part of the stress response. You can think of it as an extension of adrenal exhaustion or adrenal fatigue as problems with the catecholamines. This is worth mentioning again, you have to have the sulfur amino acids to produce epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. You have to have the sulfur amino acids to detoxify. So they're really extra important. You are often, often going to see sulfur amino acid levels low. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at the lab. Remember, you just go up to the amino acid section. And here it is, sulfur amino acids. You're often going to see low sulfur amino acids as a package with low levels of dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine. Makes sense, right? Because they're directly related. And so you've got to address these simultaneously or the programs don't work really well. And the more depleted the person is, the more important it is to do, you know, take these extra considerations. If you're not doing an ion panel and you're just doing organic acids, then you can see the sulfur compounds summarized on the urine part of the organic acids under the sulfate section. So if any of these three markers are low, or three of them are low together, I should say if really if it's this one is high and these other two are low, these are low, or this is high, or any of actually, if any of them are high or these two are low, that's probably the best way to say it. If any of these three are high or these two are low, then you've got a major problem with sulfur amino acids. And your brain program may not work unless you supply that extra methionine, taurine, cysteine, whatever you want to use supplement-wise. Glutathione is like the most important thing in the whole world. We could say nothing but good things about glutathione. Low glutathione levels pretty much catastrophic for the human condition. And this is another way of talking about it, tryptophan, there's a rate limiting step. Tryptophan hydroxylase is a rate limiting step. So tryptophan converting to serotonin can be blocked, can get shut down right here. 5-HTP is past that enzyme, so 5-HTP can th convert to serotonin in an unlimited fashion. You know, these are kind of, and then the same thing we mentioned earlier. And I want to do a little bit of a math equation here for you. Tyrosine, here's the rate limiting step here, converts to L-DOPA. But there's a limit to how much can happen. If you want to get the dopamine levels really cranked up, you want to use the herbal form of L-DOPA, which is called Makuna. And a lot of companies sell Makuna. But it's really confusing, and I want to do a little math. So I just spent two weeks with my son. <laughs> he's, he's a funny kid. He's 20 years old. He's at Washington University in St. Louis. And he's a physics math. He's a dual major in physics and math. He said he could have, well, anyways, he's, in, he's taking mostly graduate level courses now. And I'm very proud of him because I dropped out of math in calculus. And it's cool to see this kid just like, he channels math, though. It's, it's an incredible thing. We're going to do a little math here, all right? So when you see Makuna, 
it's going to be expressed. Remember, this is an herbal form of L-DOPA. This is the strong stuff. This I use this a lot because a lot of people have problems with their brain. So, But you need to be able to do a little math. Different companies sell different kinds of Makuna by concentration, right? And so sometimes you'll see it expressed as 15%, or sometimes you'll see 40%. The strongest one I could find is 60%. You don't want to buy cheap Makuna because it, it just won't work. You have to use one of the professional brands for this. You have to, have to. So if the label says 100 milligrams of Makuna, and it's rated at 15% purity, right? in terms of how much L-DOPA is in it, that means you're giving the person 15 milligrams of L-DOPA, right? However, if you're having 100, if you have a 100 milligrams of Makuna and the label says it's 60% L-DOPA, again, that's my favorite one, that means you're giving them 60 milligrams of L-DOPA. Now, for a lot of supplements, there's some slack. If you give somebody extra magnesium, they get diarrhea. I don't think anyone ever died from diarrhea, from magnesium. You just tell people, hey, if you take too much magnesium, you get diarrhea, just cut your dosages back, right? It's not like a dangerous thing. Most supplements, vitamin C is kind of like that too. However, L-DOPA can go bad if you give people the wrong amount of L-DOPA. So you really got to do the math and make sure that whatever company you're using, you're figuring out the number of milligrams of L-DOPA per pill not the number of milligrams of Makuna. So the milligram is obviously the weight, right? That's how much weight, uh, how many milligrams of Makuna by weight they put in there. But what matters is the purity of it. And the purity can range from five or 10% up to 60%. So you could get one supplement that's literally five times stronger than another one. So just do the math on that and make sure that you figure out, you know, how much L-DOPA you're actually giving people uh, to make all that work. And the two brands I recommend the most, Pure Encapsulations, Designs for Health. They're the ones that I'm the most familiar with all these years. There's plenty of other great brands out there, but those are the ones that I probably use the most often. Uh, so we just want to talk about this a little bit. Um, it's just a, a, a quick mention on neuron damage, chemical, heavy metals, physical trauma. Just be on the lookout for all that, right? Because that's just part of the you know, overall bigger picture of trying to diagnose what's going on with people. Now, we do have a special offer. If you guys are interested, you sign up by September 5th, you save $1,000 off the one-year program. What the program is, is a series of lectures that I've done that are pre-recorded. You get a whole year's worth of these lectures taking you through all the different topics. We have a weekly live call where we we review labs and there's a lot of brainstorming and problem solving and you know just kind of one-on-one -on -one mentorship that goes on in the the lab sessions and um we have right now richard lord as our sort of senior teacher that's doing master classes for students we have uh duncan mcdonald who's teaching on monday nights now with a uh, focus on some of the basics on adrenal and gi testing and he's been doing really well um i've teached myself you know uh, a large number of the courses as well. And then we have an online community of tons of doctors that are doing this work, that are communicating with each other. So we have the community feature, we have the lectures, and we have the live calls. It's a pretty comprehensive course for those of you that are ready to really jump in and learn your functional medicine stuff. All right, so let me pause for a moment again and take some questions. Uh, Oh, so the dosages uh, that you're looking at, uh, good question, Ann. Hi, Ann. I haven't talked to you in a while. Um, so the dosages that we're looking at would be, um, that's a really good question. Let me see. Well, let me pull up a product here. Um, hang on. So I'll give you guys like a range because this stuff is really strong. I always start with tyrosine first, and if that tyrosine is not doing it, then we're looking at, let's see, um, someone can do the math. Let me get my calculator here. So let's say um, 
let's say 400 milligrams at 60%. 400 milligrams times 0.6. So around 200 milligrams of actual Makuna. Two, I'm sorry, 200 milligrams of, of Makuna standardized you know, in the L-DOPA form. So in the pure form of L-DOPA, around 100 milligrams twice a day. So for some pills, that may be 10 pills. For other pills, it may be one or two, okay? Um, so around 100 milligrams of the L-DOPA twice or three times a day. Some people get liver enzyme elevation from taking 5-HTP. Yeah, so you got to be working on the liver. Remember, we just said that. So you, you, you don't want to use amino acids just blanketly. You want to make sure that the liver is kind of taken into account um, for all of this stuff as a kind of optimal kind of combination. All right. So the last and final section here, because we're way over time. I always end these on time. I apologize. But I just want to go through one lab one time. I'm going to highlight everything that relates to the brain on this lab from the beginning to the end. Okay. So you can measure, number one, you can measure the level of the amino acids themselves. Tryptophan, super important. And we're just going to stick with the super important ones. You can also measure the levels of tyrosine. And if those levels are low, you want to supplement with them. If those levels are high, it means that they're circulating in the bloodstream. The amino acids circulating in the bloodstream, you need to give some B6 so the person can break it down. So if you see high levels of many, neuro of many amino acids, you give B6. If you see low levels, you give that amino acid itself. So that's kind of ground zero in this battle. And then you also want to check this tryptophan large neutral amino acid ratio. Okay, if that ratio is high, it's meaningless. I don't even know why they report it if it's high. But if it's low, it means that the person needs tryptophan, simply put. We're just covering the highlights here, right? I don't have time. I, you know, I just want to make this the most important stuff. Selenium, we said, is super important for protecting the brain. So make sure that's in good shape. Fat-soluble antioxidants. And the 80-HDG marker, if those are high, um, if the 80-HDG is high or the fat-soluble antioxidants are low, there's a way you can help prevent inflammation to protect the brain with antioxidants. Omega-3s and omega-6s, some of the most important things for the brain. So if these are low, you got to support um, with the omega-3s, critical for the brain. And again, I'm just going through the highlights here. And then this is where we talked a lot about here. Xanthurinate levels are off. If xanthurinate marker is high, it means you need B6 to get the brain working properly. If fig glue is high, it means you need folate to get the brain working properly. Vanomandolate, homovanolate, or hydroxyindolacetate, high or low, you support with the corresponding amino acid. Kynurinate, quinolinate, or picolinate, high, you've got brain inflammation. Okay. You still can support with amino acids, but you figure out why the brain's inflamed. Look at the um, you know, antioxidant levels, get the inflammation under control. As part of any good brain program, you want to make sure you get the sulfur amino acids in the system. You look at the glutathione markers here right, and detox, so the liver's in good shape. You're always thinking about the liver when you think about the brain. And then that's it. We're going to stop right there. Okay, so last couple of questions here. Uh, can you use Makuna to boost dopamine in order for testosterone to be activated? For Absolutely, yeah. Oh man, that's like DARP32 question, dude. R Rene Saint Laurent, I probably pronounced your name wrong because I cannot, for the life of me, get a, a French accent going. But that's a DARP32 question. That's a really good question. So let me just show you DARP32. So Renee's question specifically was, would you use Makuna to boost dopamine in order for testosterone to be activated for low libido? And that's a DARP32 question. So here's DARP32. This is really cool. If you have you know, some free time, you should study this. So DARP32, it was, the Nobel Prize was given out for the folks that discovered this. The short version of you know, like years of study here is that dopamine is the master controller 
over many, many compounds, not only mo many of the brain chemicals, but also the sex hormones. So you can absolutely use dopamine to control serotonin, um, to control um, testosterone, estrogen, et cetera. Okay, that's super important. Uh, all right, I'm gonna wrap it up because we're way over time. Okay, gang, I hope this was helpful and you can help some people out there. I hope you consider signing up for the class because we need students starting in the fall. We have a pretty good group already. We need a few more and I look forward to working with you. All right, take care everyone. Talk to you later.